Are you black enough refers to a perpetual conflict the black community faces whenever one of us changes the focus of the accepted cultural lens. This social criteria, this black barometer serves as a way for us to find our identity, an identity that was severed and broken when we were placed in captivity. And as we view our diaspora, as we refocus our consciousness, I must constantly ask myself a simple question. What does it mean to be black? What deems us as being black in America? What deems us as being black around the globe? I often speak about the one drop rule, an American definition that legally defined a person as being black if they had one trace of black ancestry. But mitochondrial Eve was born 200,000 years ago. She serves as a maternal ancestor for all living humans. She was African. She was black. We are all black. But for purposes of this topic, let's forget about science just for a minute. Let's socially examine our own rhetoric. Is blackness monolithic? Does an Oreo cookie exist in human form? If so, is there really an African-American compass, a direction or lifestyle that centers us in the middle of true blackness? If we are too successful by default, do we become off-centered, a bit off-kilter? Well, I brought someone to help me better understand the definition of blackness. A leader, a hero, a venerable icon that exudes black ex excellence to the fullest. A father, a host, an actor, theatrical performer, producer, comedian, improv genius, a musician, a you do it all Grammy Award nominated, a Emmy Award winning master of all trades. Man. I'm honored to welcome to Invisible Blackness my dear, dear friend, Mr. Wayne Brady. How are you, brother? Brother, after that kind of intro what can i possibly say that's like uh you you just gave me all of my flowers right now <laughs> thank you so much man uh man you know thank you you know i mean we we've been friends for a while and yeah you know bef be before I, before we met you know i would i would just see you everywhere you have this very omnipresent uh character where you are accepted by everybody, you know? And, you know, I want to start this off by asking this one question. Yes, sir. How do you define success? That's, that is a beautiful, beautiful question. And isn't that the thing that we always ask ourselves? Um, Absolutely. Or, or rather, we should be asking ourselves. You are talking to somebody who's going to turn 49 this year. So right. my definition of success is different than the 25 year old and the 29 year old and the 30, the 35. Mm. Right now, my definition of success is that if I were to leave, leave this mortal coil tomorrow, would my family be taken care of? Would my daughter be all right? Have I left her enough that she is okay and she can make her way in this world? And besides that, what have I, when people speak about Wayne, what would they say? Mm. It's not enough for me to be successful enough that they're like, oh man, I used to love his show. That's cool. Yeah. Because that's cool. And yes. for some people, maybe that's cool. But the older that I've gotten and the more that I've learned, Especially, I love how, you know, this whole podcast and, and from the episodes that I've watched and even knowing you talking about identity, success to me means to leave, leave an imprint mm. and not just an imprint as a man. And this is going to sound backwards to some people. Yes. And, and I want to get to this later because I love this topic of black, black enough, because there's a flip side of it too, to the, 
to the people that may not be you, that may be white people that like you and then may not like you because you're too black. So I'll jump into that later. But as a man, I want to leave a mark as a father, as someone who moved the needle, maybe with race talks, talks about allyship with our Asian and Hispanic uh, brothers and sisters, someone who left after engaging in talks and moving the needle where it comes to the, the, the black culture and its relationship to the LGBTQ plus community and our mm-hmm. own, own issues within that. Right. And, as a, and lastly, as a black man who was a father who helped to go against any stereotype that has been either self-perpetuating or perpetuating yeah. from the outside about how black men don't w- stick around with their their kids and how we 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 only go after certain things and all of the negative crap that you could say if at the end of the day I'm gone and those boxes have been checked then I'm successful well you know it's interesting because whenever whenever we're together you're a regular guy and you're a regular guy every single day yeah but people don't understand that. It's, you know, w- when I was preparing for our discussion, I said, let me just go through this brother's history right quick. And I'm seeing all these things that I forgot about, you know? And I'm like, I- I'm just looking at the fact that you're not even 50 years old yet. And you've accomplished so much on a work level that, you know, A lot of people would ask what's next, but at the same time, we live our life from the perspectives of making our dreams a reality, right? Mm -hmm. And you've been doing that for so long, but at the same time, you are a human being that has to deal with everyday issues. Amen. And because of that, you are an easy target. Yeah. You are an easy target because of your perceived success, that means you're now vulnerable to being the scapegoat for people that aren't secure in themselves. And we'll get into that more later. But I I remember the first time I actually really started to become aware of you was on uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Yes, sir. And was that like around 98? Am I mistaken? You like, are no. dead on. That that wow. was my first year on that show. Yeah. So 98. So how did you even how did you even come on the scene? Wow. Um, I will try to compress this. Well, right. basically, I did come out of nowhere, which I've heard, you know, stand-ups and other comics, which I never consider myself a comic until I got that show. They're like, we've been in line and this cat just popped up on TV. And that's where some, some, of, some of the hate, <laughs> hate came, came from, from at first. And, oh, wow. and I understand it now. You know, now I yeah. get it because I've been around. But mm. I came onto the scene in a nutshell. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I uh, started working as a singer, dancer, actor in Orlando. And I was doing improv and sketch with a theater company called SAC Theater. So my whole goal was just to get out of Florida and then past that, I really didn't have a goal. I was like, well, well, no, no. My one goal was, was God, please give me the ability to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't say, well, I want to be on TV. I want to be famous. My biggest goal was to be on Broadway. I said, God, mm-hmm. if you could just give me the ability to work, that's all I want is I want to work and I want to take care of my mom. So mm-hmm. I got that in spades. So I did cruise ships. I was a singer dancer at Disney. I was a character at Disney. I worked at Universal Studios. I did dinner theater. I did a lot of musicals and whatnot. Moved from, uh, from Orlando, made a pit stop in St. Louis, did a theme park show at Six Flags over Mid-America, stopped in Las Vegas, worked at the MGM Grand when the MGM Grand had a theme park. So I was wow. a singer dancer during the day. And at night I would sub in in different bands. Then I went to Hawaii for a musical. That's where I met my ex-wife, who's now my best friend and my producing partner. We moved to L.A. together. And when I hit L.A. in 90, the end of 95, beginning of 96, I started working immediately. But not like on TV. I was hustling. I was doing Mm. theater. I was singing in bands. I was we we used to have a pretty active supper club scene here back in the day. So, So I was in a couple casual bands, did a lot of work in San Diego. 
I was doing musicals at the time still. I was singing on cruise ships, um, doing improv with, with the company that I came out with. And it was through doing that show at the Acme Theater with the guys that I came out here with, that's when I first came to the attention of the producers for, um, for Whose Line Is It Anyway? And they invited me to come to the audition. And now keep in mind, I'd been watching the show since I was a kid because mm-hmm. it had already been on the air 10 years in the UK. I mm-hmm. loved it. it. It wasn't my bag. I never gave myself the credit to think I could be on that show. I, I moved out to LA to be either in a musical or to be on a TV show, or to, or to get a record deal in, in a band. That's all mm-hmm. I had in my mind. So nobody was more surprised than when I got cast for Whose Line at the end of like a eight hour audition where they were just throwing wow. cats out the door. You, you wow. three, do, do this. All right, you're gone. You do that, <laughs> you stay, you stay. Yeah. And then finally I was left and that gig wow. changed my life. Wow. So. It's interesting because in a show that we'll talk about in a minute, in 2006, you said to a group of people, you may not know this, but a large percentage of the daytime television audience is black. And then fast forward and every single day you're around America on daytime television every single day for what, over a decade now or something for a, you know, for a very long time. We just wrapped our 12th season. We're going into our 13th season. We just got picked up for it. Congratulations. So like, okay. h- how difficult was it for you to move up into this area? You're, you're now into the homes of America. Oh, yeah. In a different way. How difficult was it for you to accomplish that as a black man? You know, here's the funny part. It wasn't difficult at all. And I'm not going to take any credit for it. I think it was, it was the way that things happen in this town. And as you know, even on the music side, if there's somebody in some office that says, get me that dude, Adrian. Yeah. I'm going to make a record with him and then I'm going to put him on a TV show. Yeah. As long as that machinery has been put into place, oh, yeah. you go make that record and you will be on that TV show. Yeah. When I got Whose Line, the world opened up. I was a fresh face and I was the beneficiary of, because I was the only black voice on that show. I was the only me. I stuck out Mm. and not, not only because of my race, but I would like to think that I kicked ass on it. Folks said Mm -hmm. they'd never seen a performer like me on whose line is it anyway? Because I was a package that, none of the other actor comedians that have ever done improv in that setting brought with them because wow. all that training, all that stuff. And I sit, and I told you all that stuff on purpose, the stuff yeah. about the theme parks and the, yes. and the gigs, because if it had not been for all of those small gigs and driving to San Diego for, I lie to you not for 50 bucks and wow. come coming back, if it not for being on a cruise ship and a lounge singer in Tokyo dancing in a goofy costume at Disney, yeah. doing all that stuff, I would have never been cast for Who's Line because that gave me a tool chest to pull from that none of these cats had. Nothing against them because they're all brilliant right. in their right. way. My right. thing was I could sing. I could do the musical impressions. I could dance. I was physical. I did stunts. Like I was a stunt man at one point. So I could throw my body around. So whatever you say, do I embodied the yes. And of it because I was hungry. I was hungry. Wow. So it's interesting when you're, when you're talking about your hunger and how black America has to deal with the journey to get to where you are. They all like mm-hmm. there's there's this this feeling that you must sell out in order to get to here or there. So it's when you're telling me your story, it's analogous to the minstrel dancers that traveled America because this is the first form of paid entertainment that we got, you know, which is blackface in America. This is how we were being able to be part of the quote entertainment industry. So all that hard work that you did, did you ever feel like you had to sell yourself out or did you feel like you were just working hard and just being unapologetically you? 
I was working hard in being unapologetically me because even to think about those words, and I have to say that for, for your viewers and listeners, even in my early days, I got so much love from my brothers and sisters because I think it was fresh to see someone like me in that capacity, killing it. Yes. And to anybody who would say later on, oh, well, Wayne Brady's selling out, you know, he's with, with those three, blah, 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 and he's doing this. They had problems of their own. Right. And, and they have their, you know, I cannot be the arbiter, nor do I want to be the arbiter of race. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be the police person of race. That's not my job. Yeah. I, I'm tired enough being the police person of Wayne and taking care of me. Right. So, so all I could do was be me. So when I heard things about selling out, I, I won't lie. It, it, it got to me, especially at one point, I think when it reached its height was after whose line, I did a couple series. And then I got the daytime talk show where I replaced Rosie, the, the Wayne Brady show. That's what I was saying about the machine. Somebody at Disney said, we're getting rid of Rosie. We want, we need that black face on our network. He's talented. He does this and America likes him. You know, they ran Q scores and I scored super high. Wow. And so they were like, America will take this. They took me, they gave me this talk show. I didn't want a talk show. I was getting ready to do a sitcom. Wow. I, I moved out here to act, but I recognized the platform. So they put me on the talk show. All of a sudden I'm in people's living rooms. That's why I say that it wasn't anything that I did. I was part of the machinery. But here's the thing. Once I was in the machinery, I said, oh, I've got this talk show. It's like when I was a kid, you know, watching the Mike Douglas show right. or when David Letterman had a show in daytime, I said, well, I don't want to be in a suit and behind a desk. I want to do a mix up of those daytime shows and like Arsenio. Yeah. I said, take, take advantage of you've got a brother. This, this is the first time that I'll be able to do something completely different. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Cut to the first day of work. Hey guys, why am I sitting behind a desk and why I'm in a suit? And why has it been? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. So I kept being told by people in my circle who aren't with me anymore, in success, you can write your own ticket. Just do what they say right now. So the lone black face on this network doing what, what I'm doing, I was by myself. I, I was the first. So all I had to do was go, okay, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to do this thing. And when it hits, I'll be able to do what I want to do. Okay. That was my mantra. I knew that something was wrong the day that cats like, I think at, at, at one point I heard Chris Rock say something about me and I love Chris Rock and Chris and I've spoken since, and he, he's one of my, my, like, I look up to him as a comedy God, but he made a disparaging, uh, and I can't even tell you what it was, but, but it basically was <laughs> fill in the blank of Wayne, da, 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 you know, this dude too white, like what, whatever the thing was. And I looked up and I went, wait a minute, something's wrong. And then I started hearing more of it. And I realized that what I'd let happen under the guise of I'm keeping my head down to make this work, to get to someplace else. So I could bust through this door for every talk show segment staple, like a cooking segment that I did with a little old white lady from, from Pennsylvania. Wayne, I just love you. She pinches my cheeks and we do this thing and I'm telling America, we'll be right back. And then for everything like that, that, that was designed to make people feel good and to make me innocuous, to make me innocent and non-threatening yes. and, and, and now, mind you, when I'm doing my act at night, doing my improv stand stand up show, it's it's an adult show, and I'm just doing me. But I realized at some point that I'd started to to move the dial on what I was willing to do, and the kind of thing that I found funny and entertaining. And I didn't sell out, but I realized that I was compromising because I wanted to compromise to to see the end goal. And at one point. And I, and I really haven't talked, talked about this. So I guess you're one of the first people I'm talking to it about out loud. I was in a meeting with an exec who I will let remain nameless. Um, who I remember the day that she said, we, we basically had a disagreement about me going to Boston, one of our markets, cause the show is in syndication and having dinner with that 
head of the network out there. And I just had my daughter or my wife had just had my daughter. I was like, I'm not getting on a plane to go to Boston to do that right now. And the conversation carried on. And, and then at some point I said, you know what? I'm not going to let you whitewash me anymore. And I don't want anyone listening to be mad if you happen to have a, a, a white listener, because I'm not saying that I'm mad at white people or that it's not that. So don't. It's, I realized that the things that were intrinsically me, the, list, the music that I listened to, the songs that I wanted to perform on air, the guests that I wanted to have, the stories I wanted to tell within a talk show form, they were being knowed. Nope, mm. nope. No, we can't. I, I wanted to have Missy Elliott on. Mm, no, 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 no. I wanted to have Busta Rhymes on. No, 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 no. I'm a hip hop head. You know me. Right. I asked, in fact, I wanted to get Tribe on. Wow. They were like, first off, they're like, who? That was it. And then I went, bedrock of hip hop. You don't understand this, the blah, 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 blah. That's not uh, our demo. And that's when I said, wow. but, I, but that's not your, I'm on the net. It's my demo too. Can I decide what the demo is? I'm bringing in people. No. So I had that conversation and it basically ended with, with me saying, I'm not going to go. And she said, well, maybe we need to find someone who can do this. <laughs> and it was one of the first times in my career that I felt that I was, I would have been 31 years old. 31, had a little bit of money in the bank. Not a super success yet. But I was willing to go, you know what? If you can find someone who can do the Wayne Brady show better than Wayne Brady, then please do. I'm going home. I'd never felt so proud of myself. Cut to Monday morning. Variety. Tony Danza will, will be taking over the Wayne Brady show Wayne Brady will not be renewed past the season. Tony Danza will be uh, do, it's filling this slot and Tony will be doing it. And I laughed. I laughed because I went, oh my God, that's brilliant. Because she still couldn't do what I said. I said, find a Wayne Brady to do the Wayne Brady show. No, you had to find Tony Danza to try to do the Tony Danza show, but you're not going to find my show. And when that happened, I will tell you there was a freedom because I still had I still had a season to go. This happened at the beginning of the season. So at that point, if I know that I'm canceled, I was like, really? Got you. Missy Elliott, Outcast, Busta Rhymes, <laughs> Nivea, and next. I, oh, Brian McKnight. Oh, wow. I had the act I wanted to have. I was, I stopped wearing the suit. I came in in oh, a nice little God. blazer and my thing. I felt like me. And I learned a very important lesson at that point. I learned a lesson about it isn't good enough to just go, I'm going to keep my head down until I get to this place. You have to keep on making noise to get to the place you want to get to. And the other nail in it was when Dave Chappelle, well, when Paul Mooney infamously made the, I, I make Brian Gumbel look like Mal, Malcolm right. X joke, which to, to this day, I still say isn't funny just as a person that writes jokes. It's not funny to me because it's predicated on the belief that everybody hearing that joke is going to feel the way that you do, that I represent something other than blackness. And I was so proud of myself because I went, you know what? Fuck you. Yeah. Because then when Dave gave me the opportunity to come on the show and, and we did that sketch, that sketch blew up and it's in the, the annals of comedy history. So and that made me so happy. So that's a we will get there because I definitely want to talk about that. I'm still tripping on everything you just told me. Yeah, um, man. Because everybody has those stories, the same story yep. that you're saying right now, and a lot of these decisions are racist decisions, and the issue is whether they're intentional because a lot of these kinds of, de- of decisions are just based on tradition and custom. You know, they're right. putting a job, they're putting a, they're put in a position to perform. They have to make decisions that bring in the ratings. And when they're telling you things like this, they're doing their job, but in doing their job, are they being racist? And I will say yes, because they knew what they were doing and or they should have known what they were doing. Now, it's in 2006, 
Mm-hmm. You did that three part series. Uh, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Now, was this after? Uh, that was after this. This yes, show is after. Okay, so yes, that show and the first episode, the first part of that, you had Harry Belafonte. You had uh, Di- you had Diane Carroll. You had, yeah, you had Paul Mooney, who we will talk about, and you had Torre. And one of the questions was dealing with our name. You know, are we African-American? Are we black? You know, and, and, and then the conversation went into the use of the word nigga. And Harry said, and I paraphrase, no other group has been in such a protracted search of title. Mm. And then Diana, Di- Diane Carroll, rest in peace, said it was a camouflage to distract us from important things like money and moreover livelihood. And she also dichotomized her relationship with the term because she, unlike us, comes from the segregation era. And also in my American Negro album, I talk about this pejorative term of choice. My question for you is whether you believe that it's important for us to have an agreed upon name or identity Obviously, you pretty much just answered that because that is what took you to this now being in the show. But talk to me about all this. Oh, that it, man. First off, the record is oh, amazing. Thank I, you, I, I haven't even talked to you about oh, that even yeah. offline. Thank you, man. So Appreciate that. It's, it's such a nuanced conversation, man, because yeah. what I like to think of and one of the many ventures that I'm doing is I'm also doing a uh, graphic novel mm. with a guy named Michael Davis, who um, was the creator of the Static Shock character. And part of the conversation that we had is is in creating our universe. Yes, it's you know I I've always been a kid of sci-fi, so I always posit myself di- different questions about the what ifs and the what ifs and why and and this would be gr- crazy if this happened. One of the things that I've always wanted to see examined in sci-fi is what would the world do without the American black? Because we are a very specific thing. Like that's why when we have the word term African American and and so what 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 whatever you want to call yourself, African American, or you say that you're black, or you know, you're with your buddies and and you want to you use the N-word and this dude's it. That all of that is secondary to me because I feel that the need for us always finding an identity is because we are displaced. The American black is a, and this is just my opinion, that if you were looking at nature, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and nature says, this is the way that I'm laying all, all of this out. What happened to, to, the, to the Africans that were brought here and we, their descendants, that if you think of it in a scientific way, in my mind, it's a mutation. So we are different. We are different than our kindred in Africa. We are different than our kindred anywhere. It's no accident to me that we are, that we are different and we are the reasons for so much culture and music and acting and sports and innovation and whatnot. With, by that act of taking us from Africa and bring, bringing us here, we had to be different to live and to survive Absolutely. on foreign land. So Absolutely. you just couldn't be normal. We had to develop. In fact, um, I have a series that I'm getting ready to do with the, um, the uh, oh, my God, my mind is racing so fast in New York, um, in Carnegie Hall, oh, wow. where, I, where I'm giving a presentation in two parts about improvisation. I say, it's no surprise to me that I'm good at improvisation. It's no surprise to me that Black people invented jazz because we are the masters of improvisation. Yes. If, it's, if, if as slaves, you, you can take the leftovers that the overseers threw because they didn't huh. want this piece of the hog and that piece of, of, of the cow and you eat that and here you can have these grains and whatnot. And we made it soul food. We made it comforting for us. We made it something that other cultures fly from all, all over the world to go to the South for. We've, we've built our whole identity on making do and making it better. So it wow. doesn't surprise me. So that's a long story to, we, we still defy any real name. We're always searching for that title because we are different. We know that we are, that there's something different and stronger the, uh, uh, about a people that had to survive. So well, if we take 
take the N word and we take nigga and we take it, then I, I understand that. Right. I completely understand it. it. It doesn't mean that I want to use it because yeah. my point, point of view is, is I'm comfortable using it, but I don't really because I, I kind of live by the mindset of I never want to say it or, or, or I wasn't raised saying it because the last thing I want is somebody who doesn't look like me going, you said it. Right. Exactly. So I'm just going to, because <laughs> growing up in the South, I heard it too much in the pejorative sense and yeah. directed at me and directed at my grandfather and grandmother. So it's nothing that I choose to, you know, use in my everyday language, but I, but, but, but I completely understand the brothers and sisters that use it and it sings well it's a very musical word it does you know it's interesting when we're talking about this concept of identity because identity is your self-esteem and your self-esteem is vital to your well-being your perspective your your perseverance in life you know we dress differently because our sortorial perspectives reflect the evolution of our identity our consciousness and the reason why i bring this up because it, it's it's an indictment um it's an indictment of our it's an, it's an indictment on America because of the fact that, like you said, we were severed from our heritage. Now, African-American history starts with freedom because in Africa, we were free. In Africa, we were doing jazz. In Africa, we weren't monolithic. We were a bunch of different tribes with a bunch of different customs, a bunch of different personalities. And when we came to America, when we got onto the slave ships, <clears throat> we were stripped of all that and we had to find ourselves again. Okay. Yeah. When we were here on the plantations, we had first names. And if we had a last name, it was, it was you know, it was our enslaver surname or it was our occupation or it was the, the, the town. But we had to do so much to let people know that we are here and we are alive. We had to empower ourselves. So when we talk about blackness. You know, we know that the colors used to describe ourselves obviously divide us as much as unite us as race is a social concept, not a scientific one. Um, it's an amorphous description that really has no scientific background. But what we do identify with when we're looking at it from a strictly social perspective is ethnicity. See, a lot of people don't understand the difference between race and ethnicity. So, Please tell them. So I'll tell them. So when we're dealing with ethnicity, we're dealing with a group of people that share a distinct commonality and culture. And when we're dealing with race, we're dealing with a socially created classification system whereby you are identified by characters such as common descent. So where did race come from? See, slavery is derivative from racism. Racism. I'm sorry. Racism is, deri is derivative from slavery. And we were categorized as creatures, as barbarous people that were brought here to make our lives better. And we're still dealing with the machinations mm. of our captivity in our journey. So when we identify with each other, it's important for us to know what to call each other because it just symbolizes a new truth, right? So I, I say all this to come to this because this is where I want to really now get into the Dave Chappelle stuff and all that. Is there really an African-American compass, a direction or a lifestyle that centers us in the middle of true blackness? Well, in order to answer that question, though, we'd have to define what true blackness is. Yes. Right? right. I mean, right. because before we define the parameters, yes. you have to define the thing. Yes. And, and I mean, the only thing that I can think, think of in all my years of, of, of thinking about race, and race has always been something that has been on my mind because being raised in the neighborhood that I was, was raised in the being, being raised in the hood, but being bused to, uh, to a predominantly white school with kids that didn't look like me. 
and having to learn to code switch and, and to fit in in both, both places and navigate, I've always thought, thought about it because there were times when I had no choice because pe- people at home were saying, you, you aren't black enough and I go over here and then you are too black, I don't understand you. So what do you do when you're in there? You take a blow to your self-esteem, you take a blow to all these things and, and you're always trying to navigate. Yes. So when I think about the topic of blackness, I understand, I don't like it, but I understand why someone would look at someone else. And depending on where you're from, if you feel that you, all of your identity, because that's, that, that's who I feel that we are as a black American people, we're always on the quest for identity and for looking for our tribe. That's why we we call each other, you know, our names or we dap each other up yeah. or we, we're always signifying to each other to make sure that we, we are in this together. Absolutely. So if someone comes out of left field and looks like they are not of your tribe or of the same shared experiences, because maybe they share more mm. with mm. those other people. Mm. Mm. Maybe they share more with them who have who, who, who historically have, have, have uh, impeded our progress and had a thumb on, on, on our backs, mm-hmm. then you, you don't smell right. <laughs> then you don't smell right. Then you don't smell right. And you don't talk right. You don't, so you can't be one of us. Right. I don't agree with that because right. I don't think I don't think there's any handbook to be black. I, I love to say that when I was born, this is the skin I'm in. Right. This is me. Right. So I'm black when I wake up. I'm black when I go to sleep. Sleep. I'm black if I host a game show. I'm black if I talk about quantum physics, or yeah. I'm black if I quote Biggie. I'm black. I, I want to interject for a second. So, you know, one of the reasons why I love you so much is because you remind me a lot of myself, right? So we don't talk with the typical vernacular that, you know, a black dude in South Central may have, right? Because that is where, that, that is the compass that a lot of people use to define whether you are black or not, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing against somebody from South Central at all. But I was raised in various places in America because my father was in the military. So I was in upstate New York to Alabama, from Lancaster, California to Cerritos to Fontana to Orange County. But just like you said, I grew up with the different people around me. The first time I was really around at least a handful of black people at school, I was in seventh grade, eighth grade. So, really? yeah. So, you know, I was always the black dude picked first on all, you know, obviously if there's sports or whatever, or if there's anything to do with music <laughs> or dancing. But hey, I was nice at it, though. So it's OK. But I was always that token. At the same time. It was the best way for me to grow up, because, as you know, when we are around white people, we are as comfortable as we are with black people. And I know we both have a lot of friends that may be black that never had that chance to interact with other ethnicities, other races, and they get nervous and don't know how to be themselves in front of other people. So it's, it's interesting how our perspective is on race relations, where we see people as people, we understand what the white side means, we understand what the black side means, but we're really just people. And you said something very interesting to Bill Maher 2013 uh, in (laughs) reference to his comment, where he said he compared you to President Obama because in popular culture, you were supposedly not black enough. You took offense to that. And I'm glad you took offense to that. And could you talk about why you took offense to that? Well, yeah, I took in, in, in fact, I'm trying to think of the quote. I think really what he said, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing him, 
the genius that is Bill Maher, he said something regarding, he's like, he wishes that President Obama was a little more something. I, I, yeah. I, I think he said a little more thug or da-da-da, as opposed to being a, a little more Wayne Brady. Uh, so when I heard that, even you can't win for losing sometimes, yeah. right? So now I can take that from my own folks yeah, because I get where it comes from and I can give back as good as I take. Yes. But then to me, and I explained this to Bill, there was a line that was crossed. Bill and, and, and other comedians and people like Bill in whatever the shoes are that Bill Maher walks in, because you have a black friend or because you date black women or because you feel comfortable in certain black spaces because you feel that you have been awarded some sort of pass does not make you comfortable enough to then turn around and pass judgments and say things about people in that culture. At least to me, that's my opinion. So how dare you, Bill, say that our president, who in that one fell swoop, he was casting like just he took away all of president obama's accomplishments right by saying that you need to be this kind kind of leader and you know stop acting like the black guy that that we don't think is stereotypical and you need to act like like you know the dude and then when they do they go you know like the you know like that and they yeah. do that thing yeah how dare you how dare you? So yeah. yes, I said what I said to him and I meant what I said but what, to, the, to him. But to me, the, the part that really resonated with me is that you said it because it'll allow his viewers to make the same stereotypical assumptions about black people. That is something Absolutely. you don't hear. And that is deep as hell. It's not just because he's white and saying it. Yes, that's a variable. But as a white person saying it, there's now other white people out there that are going to think that he's an authority. Bingo. Exactly. They're going to go, see, Bill said it. So what I said to him, and I said to him exactly, and I'm going to paraphrase myself, was, was if, you, if you want to see that person that you're talking about, that stereotype that you're talking about, I will show you that person. Come and meet me so I can <laughs> beat your ass and show you that person. Yeah. Now, anyone that knows me, yeah. that's not, I don't run around every day threatening people or saying, let's do this or whatnot. Yeah. But he made a point. So I made a point back. Right. He made a point rooted in the stereotypes are the most harmful things for any race. For, for any single race. The Absolutely. stereotypes, and, and not to say that some stereotypes, because stereotypes can be grounded in, in reality, depending on the stereotype. Right. And there are some that we even, that we as black folk, we will joke with each other about yeah. certain things, right. but I don't want to hear you say it, yeah. but we can joke about certain things. So, so for him to, to say that, that Mandingo like badass brother, uh, works, uh, you know, Suge, Suge Knight-esque energy, uh, Radio Raheem cat that he has in his mind that when any comic or someone does their black impression, that's what they have in their mind as a black person. So it completely invalidates anybody else. So, mm. so that's, that's the harm in that because then that, that goes from one person to the next. In fact, that, that harms us in the arts. It harms us with roles. If a casting director says, well, the way that I see this character is, you know, right. he's like, and, Holly, and I go, no, Hollywood no, no. shuffle. <laughs> yeah. So who, you know, more like, Hey, my man is like, yeah. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. 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 It's like, you know, and, but that is blackface. It's a caricature of black culture. This it's is a as a white person. Culture. See, a lot of people don't realize that blacks and whites didn't really mix unless you were on the plantation and you had black people living on your plantation. So it was a spectacle to be able to have an optic into the way that they lived. So for the first time, you had these black troops traveling around America. Uh, well, well, you had these black minstrels, but then you had white people imitating these minstrels in blackface, showing white people how black people are. And then that created the mystique the everlasting mystique that we are still trying to conquer 
We are not those caricatures. We're not feeble minded uh, creatures. We are equitable people. We are not eugenically inferior. So, what's interesting about this concept of overdetermined stereotypes is that out of the millions of things that you've done, one of the shining moments in not only your career, but Dave Chappelle's career is when you were on that show and you played the Thug Wayne Brady character. And I hadn't seen it for years and I watched it last night and it was so damn funny. Could you talk to us about how that even came about? Yes, it's derivative of what comment first? Yes, of Paul saying that uh, yes. uh, Wayne, Wayne Brady makes Brian Gumbel look like Malcolm X. Right, and that and was on the Dave again, Chappelle show. That was on the show. And that was on the Dave Chappelle show. And, yes. and so, as I've explained in the past, Paul Mooney, you know, Paul Mooney is a comedy legend. He is, I will lay my hat at Paul Mooney's feet. He is someone who has helped write the book on comedy and on black comedy. Where I take offense and I just don't take offense for me. Here is the thing. I take offense for anyone because we are not a monolithic people. And, mm -hmm. and that's the thing that as soon as you make a joke like that, just like it's the flip side. It's like when Bill Maher makes that joke about me and it could have been me or anybody else, mm -hmm. but he happened to involve our president in it. So when Bill Maher makes that joke, that joke, is supposed to resonate the expectation from somebody ju ju just like music. You play a certain chord, that chord has a vibration. It's supposed to make you feel a certain thing. So if I'm doing a joke and I'm building tension and I'm looking at the audience and, and I say, Wayne Brady, the audience is like, oh, what? <laughs> Makes Bryant Gumbel. We now have a picture. We're like, oh, Brian Gumbel. Yeah, yeah, that brother from HBO in the news. He talks a certain way. I remember, yeah. okay, look like Malcolm X. Oh, my God, Malcolm X, Black Treasure, moved, moved us along. He was super, super Black. So that, oh, so Wayne isn't super, super Black. So right. Wayne must be. So that's, that's the whole thought process that goes into that joke. And he's now hoping that everybody finds that funny. To me and anybody who doesn't fit a certain thing, to our detriment. And yeah. that's painful. That's painful yeah. coming from your own folks, especially right. if, if I've never lived my life as anything other than me. And I don't walk around yelling at the top of my voice, black man, black man, but that's who I am. If you ask me, I'll say so, but I've always tried to, especially from the household that I was raised in from the Virgin Islands, my, my folks, it was always make sure that you are the best and you carry yourself a certain way. So it wasn't about race for me. It was about I wanted to be the best person in the room. Yeah. But that doesn't go against my race. So right. when that joke hit, Dave reached out to me and said, hey, I, I want you to come on the show, do a sketch with me. Um, and, uh, and it turned out to be amazing because it is funny. I will stand by that sketch any day of the week. But it's funny because it blew up that stereotype. Mm -hmm. It's funny because... We really acted our asses off in that sketch. It was a real, <laughs> real scene. Yeah. And then on top of that, it took that sketch to, to this day. I, I get people that go, Wayne, man, I love you, dude. But you know, when you were that thug, I really liked you. <laughs> and that's the problem I have too. I'm like, oh, you liked me when I was selling crack and I had hose, yeah, and yeah. that and that that meant something to you. Yeah, yeah. That's a problem yeah. to me. That's a problem. Well, so so yeah. Well, you well, I mean, also you gotta look at it. They like that. They really like that you because you just acted your ass off. No one's ever seen you. Or let me rephrase: people are not familiar with you playing that character. So I mean. It's funny because it's real oh, yeah. social commentary. It's, 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 it's a lot deeper than just comedy. It's you on that show were more stereotypical, stereotypically black than the black comedian show in Dave Chappelle. 
that's funny especially be yeah even if you you know it is it, it's, it's it was it's one of my favorite moments and oh, uh you well, know no you should be proud of it but from then to now i've always looked at you as our nat king cole okay that's a deep compliment man okay Thank you. so most most don't realize that in what in 57 i believe nat king cole was his own he had his own show the only black man to have his own show at that time and and that show was never canceled nat walked away from that show right right because he, he's like if you don't want me in your living room then you don't want me in your living room exactly so it, it was in 56 and and he was obviously huge at that time and they took a chance on him. Just like you said, there's a machine, the machine's ready. Let me press a button. Mm -hmm. Now I bring that King Cole up because he broke down a lot of doors just yes, like you have done. And just like you are doing and his show was successful. It was prime time. And the ratings were high. They were great. They were great. But what was the problem? What was the problem, though? Oh, man, I'll tell you. And go this for is such it. a great... Go to YouTube and see if you could, could, um, could, uh, could watch a copy of the Nat, Nat Ken Cole show. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's available on Amazon or something. I, I don't know. I can't give you quotes, but basically what it was, was there was a white singer and I forget the name of the singer. Um, um, a female. Uh, it was Pat, uh, damn, what is it? Petty, Pam, Pam. <sighs> Fuck, man. Was it Peggy? No, oh, hold on. I'm going to look it up now because I, I should have known, known this. Um, well, there, the network had a problem with him singing this duet with her. Peggy Lee. It's Peggy, Peggy Lee. Lee. Peggy Lee. Thank you. Yes. Peggy, Peggy. Yeah, yes. he had a problem. And Peggy Lee, if if you know what Peggy Lee looked like, she was beautiful. Excuse me, blonde. Everything that America was like, oh, at that exactly. time, yes. it's Peggy Lee. And yes. then there's Nat King Cole. Right. They were like, don't be this close. Right. Don't be singing into each other's face. Don't right. do this thing. And it was a number where they were close. Right. And, and and I think that number, and to this day, you know, we, we, we will never truly know all the behind the scenes machinations or Nat's private heart. I feel I know a bit of his heart because of my journey in show business, just, yeah. just like I feel I know a little bit of Sammy's heart, right. is, is why wouldn't you just walk away from something like that if you have advertisers threatening to pull out, yes. if folks are like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. we like you, but we don't want you too close to too close and do if that's a problem if if that begins to get in the way of your art yeah then don't be there so let's put this in perspective this was that show with peggy it's two years after emmett till was murdered for apparently whistling at a white lady or supposedly supposedly yeah. whistling at a white lady okay so at the beginning of that show there was there were, you know peggy and and nat kind of had a separation but then they got closer and they were singing together and holding hands that was yes. it was the holding hands the holding hands now what people don't realize is that what if you were on television at that time there's only so many channels first of all if you are on three. yeah three channels if you are on television you are being welcomed into the homes of Americans absolutely okay so it's like you're actually in the home and you're seeing this vision of miscegenation you're seeing this white couple i mean i'm sorry this white lady innocent pure white lady and this black man now the reason why one of the reasons why Nat King and you have a lot in common is because you guys both look great. You're both very talented and you're both welcomed in the homes because you have this thing where you guys 
come off as non-threatening. And I don't mean that in a condescending way. No, I know exactly yeah, what yeah. you mean. So exactly like, mean. so in black America, if you come off as a black man that is not threatening, that is non-threatening, that means that you are either emasculated or you're a sellout because you're not a gangster, you're not a thug, you're not a pimp. So you guys both exemplified this venerable position. And because you guys were and are who you are, you were welcomed into the homes of America. Him being, having this primetime show, you being in the homes of America and of Americans every single day. Now, advertisers were pulling out, yep. especially because of the South. And what's interesting is that Max Factor, Max Factor Cosmetics turned down the show on the grounds that no Negro can sell lipstick. So Nat responded and said, well, what do you think that we use, chalk or, or Congo paint? And if a man sees a Negro on television, what's he going to do? Call up the company and tell them to take, you know, to, to, to give them the money back? And they also talked about that Coca-Cola was actually one of the sponsors. And he said, this didn't stop people from drinking Coca-Cola. You know, so he touted himself as being the Jackie Robinson of television, the pioneer, the test case, the first uh-huh. real Negro to be in the homes of millions. Um, and he said, I'm done with this show because he didn't want to deal with the nonsense. How parallel is this to you leaving your talk show? Well, to a degree, because I, I had had no intention of, of quitting that day. So in my mind, whatever decisions were made behind the scenes were, were made. If, if things would have turned around, I would have stayed with, with the show because I want, want this to be very, very clear to, to anybody watching this, because I have enough friends that have done enough podcasts and and especially at this time, right now in 2021, this day, this minute, especially someone in my position, because I'm, because I'm with, with my friend and we are discussing race, if anyone chooses to download this at some point and they take a sound bite, then the magic that they do with it is, is they'll say some, something about Wayne Brady. What, Wayne Brady doesn't like us? Wayne Brady, yeah. da-da-da? Because that's what I'm dealing with on TikTok right now. It's very funny. I posted a couple of videos, uh-huh. and these people were hundreds. I hate you, Wayne Brady, now. I used to be a fan. And, <laughs> I'll, and I didn't say any. And here's the funny thing. I didn't say anything bad. Yeah, yeah. It's no secret that I've, that I've spoke, spoken about race. Yeah. The difference is maybe you didn't listen before, and maybe yeah. an outlet like TikTok didn't. Yeah stick stick out yeah i can talk about race i'm not accusing anybody i'm not pointing any fingers when you and i discuss race we discuss race from a historical place Mm -hmm. we we discuss it from a uh, societal place Mm -hmm. and and so we discuss these things at no point am i point pointing a finger and saying these people so even with my daytime show now i love let me tell you when i know that the position that i have going into America's homes, black, white, Asian, everybody in between Latin. I go into these homes every day. I look at that as a win. I feel like the Jackie Robinson. I am the Jackie Robinson of my thing, of game show. Absolutely. And of the kind of programming that I do. I love that. So if you watch me and you rock with me, white, black, and I don't, I don't care. I, right. I love spe- sending that message. So when we talk about race and people immediately get their, their backs up about it, and you should see some of the comments. In fact, yeah. I took down the video, not because I was afraid of anything, but because I got so mad last night at some of these things that some of these cats said, like one, one person told me to go back to the field, boy. <laughs> one and yeah, this is a person man. who said i used to be a fan of yours but now that you're talking about this because i addressed the definition of white fragility yeah because someone got upset that i was doing a tiktok with with my daughter to a bernie mac sound saying who's the man 
I'm the man, strong, healthy, black man, da, 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 da. And someone said, why does it have to be always about race? Why can't it just be man? And I said to her, Sandy, I think, I think that was her name. And I wasn't trying to be angry at her. I said, Sandy, this is something that it can't just be man because he is, this is a bit from a black comedian talking about a black person and the experience. So it's just us, this, this has nothing to do with you. So when you respond in the way that you did, this is the tone deaf manner that the whole issue that we've had for the past year that's coming to fruition and, and bubbling to the surface is about. It's not about you. Don't be angry. No one pointed at you in your home and said, you're a re-. that struck a chord with you because of you. So when these people say these vitriolic things yeah. about me and boy this and and telling uh, my ex-wife Mandy to go back to the paddy fields and yeah. to call call my daughter a monkey, this yeah. is from somebody and not in the way that I would call little monkeys like you you and your right. ape. Right. This is somebody who prefaced. Well, yeah. you know what? I used to be a fan. Yeah. Think how deep that is. Right. Think of how deep it is as they let me in, people across America let me into your homes. But at the first sign of me saying something that isn't accusatory, yeah. but I have a pride in my, a, a sense of pride or I speak about something pertaining to an issue, not yeah. just me saying, I want to talk about black stuff. It's like, no, this is happening. Folks are dying behind this. It's a societal shift. You no longer want to support me or what I do because now the, now the person that made you giggle has spoken too much. And, and that's, that's deep. Well, so I don't want anyone taking this conversation out yeah. of context because this is not about hate. This is about the fact that the opposite, I love what I do so much. Yeah. So what, what, and one thing, you know, as, as my brother, I'll say to you is you don't have to explain yourself, you know? And, and my thing is this, you have to realize that you are a leader on so many levels. So as a leader, you have to expect this just like a Muhammad Ali. So with me having this podcast, with me mm-hmm. having my film that just came out 10 and, and then the American Negro, I get messages that say, you mm. know what? I used to be a fan, but you're white bashing. Someone just sent me that this week. And I said, you know, why do you call white bashing me providing you contextualized history? And then what happened was, I see, and, and it's like, I didn't, I didn't say anything bad to them. What happened was, is that all the people that get where you're coming from are going to act like soldiers and defend your position. Yep. And it makes you look better. It makes you look classy and you, and you don't have to deal with it because I always say this, every day we wake up and we have so much energy and we have to decide how is it that we're going to use our energy? If, we are going to yell at somebody that's going to take away 50% of our daily energy. Amen. And also a lot of these people just are not that intelligent. And a lot of them have been forced to believe certain things that aren't true. Well, it's cognitive dissonance. It's, 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 you could preach all day. And that's what I realized is the problem. And, and even my daughter, um, Miley was talking to me this morning because, because as someone who is in the public eye now, she has received her yes. fair share of things and we were talking and it's not my job or not your job or anyone's job to be the magical black person yeah. to, I'm now going to a- educate you. I thank God for every ally we have and everyone who, who does, who just supports is like, look, I just want to support you as a man. I feel you and I thank you for that. It's the person who can't listen to you talking about race and they, you're calling me a racist. I didn't say anything to you. Exactly. I didn't say anything to you. Right. It's a cognitive dissonance where right. you, you could go, look, I'm just trying to explain his, blah, 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 blah. Slavery's over. Get over it. <laughs> right. We let you into our homes. <laughs> right, you know, right, it's right. a very specific person that gets mad. Right, so right. I'll say that's like, I'm hoping right. that's like X percent of the people that watch what I do. Right. The other people that rock with it, I, I love those people. But see, this, that's the intransigence of the blind. It's their inability to see the truth. And when I talk to people about the fact that Abraham Lincoln was not actually a real American hero, he was somebody that did not 
respect black people. He's somebody that literally freed black people as a military move against the South during the Civil War. Because if he really wanted black people to be free, he would have emancipated all black people in America. He didn't emancipate the border slaves, the border states. That's a whole nother conversation. But the point is that when I'm educating people on our history, but we're taught something different, they look at me as the one that is erroneously revising history while I'm trying to tell them like, no, the history you've been taught is revised. Now, it starts in the schools. Right. It starts in the schools. Right. So now let's truth seek. So, so I, I want to close on this. Um, first of all, you know, as a public figure, this is going to happen the rest of your life. And it's just part of what it is, obviously. And you know that you've been dealing with it for, for decades, just is what it is. But what bothers us is that when it affects our family, when it affects our children, mm. you know, your daughter, Miley, beautiful. I love her to death. And she reminds me so much of my daughter because our daughters are both half Asian, right? And your daughter's so beautiful, oh, man. Thank you. Thank you. They're both half Asian and they're a year apart. Now, when these shootings happen in Atlanta, mm. I thought about you. And, you know, we look at our daughters. We look at their mothers. Absolutely. We look at our interracial families. And we think about the fact that now they are being targeted in a way that they weren't. But then again, it's up to us as fathers to tell them like, yo, you know, you guys have, uh, this is that, this has actually been going on for a while, but now it's just kind of, uh, boiling Elevated. up a little bit you know what i'm saying yeah so like i want i want to close in discussing first of all how you talk to your family about this secondly i want you to talk about how you raising your daughter is a little different and i want you to use the example of when you were not at home and the alarm went off in your house Wow. Okay. So first off, the conversation about race, we've had that ever since she was old enough to be able to discern that mommy and daddy look different. Yeah. And we've always been very much about this is your Japanese culture. So because Mandy is from is from Hawaii, we we've taken her there and she's been raised around the Japanese side of her family. But she's also been raised around the the Irish side of her family because Mandy is is Caucasian and and Jap Japanese. So even just with that, we always said, these are the sides of yourself that you love. You love your grandma and grandpa. They they are Irish. They don't look like daddy. You love your grandma and grandpa, even though they don't look like mommy, but you love grandpa that looks like mommy and you love me and my family. And you learn about each of yourselves. You will learn about your Japanese culture. You will learn uh, regular world, world history. You will learn about my folks from, from the West Indies. You'll also learn about my mama's side from, from you know, share, sharecroppers from, from Georgia. You will learn all, all of those things. So our conversation about race has always been, mm. know that you are not one thing, mm. but know that this is how the world may see dad. And that's the deeper conversation. Mm. It was like, just know that some people don't like dad for how he looks, but everybody likes you, dad. No, sweetheart. There are some <laughs> people who would just look at me. Yeah. Daddy didn't make, make them laugh or anything, but they'll just look at me and they don't like me because they don't like people that look like me because of hate, because of ignorance, because of just the way that, that, that they think in history. Not everybody's like that. In fact, I, I would say, Fewer people than, than most people, but those people exist. We started having those conversations when she was little because I wanted her, as she got older, to be able to walk in her own truths that I could never help her with because she is a person of mixed parentage. Right. And depending on how she presents on the outside, I taught her early on, perception is, is your thing because if you haven't gotten son, you could look 
you know, you look Italian, you you right. look Thai or you look Japanese or you look black, you look this. It, it, it all depends. So going to that story, there was a time when I wasn't at home at, and uh, we we live in Malibu and. Um, this this is all on me. This is my fear. It wasn't Miley's. This this taught taught me a lot. It was my fear. The alarm went off and immediately my mind went to the darkest place of if this rapid patrol or the cops show up to my house, my daughter, who at this point looks mixed, but like she, she is, you know, you've seen her. Yes. Um, the manila, the dark, dark manila skin. So she looks mixed, but to someone who doesn't care and they just think, who is this person? Who is this black person in this house that can't give us the code? They can't do that. I put my feelings about race and my fear because that actually did happen to me. I was at, at an old house in Sherman Oaks. I was stopped outside of my own house when I put in the wrong code and, and a unit was called and they didn't want to let me in my house until wow. the one dude goes, Hey, they're the guy from the, Hey, hey, wow. hey it's Wayne Brady. And then I was free to go in my house. So instantly I had a fear of her having guns drawn and I was like, my daughter's going to panic and I don't want her to panic and I don't want her to slam the door because they'll come in. This, I spun a story in my head and immediately I was like, get out, Miley. Why, daddy? Get out of the house right now. Get out of the house, grab, but I want to grab my stuff. Miley, just get out of the house and run down to your mom's house. That little girl grabbed her laptop and some jeans and something and ran down this little hill car- carrying her stuff. And I could laugh about it with her later on. But I was operating from, from a place of fear, yeah, of real legitimate fear. And yeah. the reason we talk about race is because then when she got to Mandy's house, Mandy and I had it out because Mandy said, why would you do that to her? Why would you scare her like that? Yeah. Why would you tell her things like that? Because I said, because it could happen. Yeah. And Mandy and I have known each other going on 25 years. Yeah. So even she's learning about race in a different mm. way because she has her own wow. struggles. And her mm. own thing. So for us to have that conversation where she was like, wow. oh my God, Wayne, you know what? I get it. And, and I understand. Wow. And that, and, and that was a really deep moment, but we've always had very honest conversations about race. Well, look, man, I'm going to stop right here because we have to have a part two at some point, you know, and yes, I, want to, I want to say to you, you know, you're an all-star, you're a perfect example of thoughts becoming things as you create a life that most aspire as to replicate. You. Come on, oh, man. You, man. As are you. The only thing yeah. missing from 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 my checklist that I'm making it through yeah. on my life <laughs> is is having a record done yeah. by you and us performing oh. together on stage. Yo, that's gonna that's happen, brother. That's no look, that's man. Want. I, I want it too, man. But you know what we're doing is what we're both doing is very important, you know. And Absolutely. I know we don't we don't see each other every day. But we're always connected and we make each other smile and 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 we will definitely make it happen. And I love you. And, um, I love you, too, you know, uh, thank you for being on Invisible Blackness. Hey, family, this is Wayne Brady and you are tuned in to Invisible Blackness.